Three, two, one. What's up, everybody? This is Mike, and this is another episode of Hammered. I hope everyone's having a great day so far. And on today's show, we've got my man, Toby Smith. Um, he's an old buddy of mine back in the cornhole days. Um, I don't know. Toby, I've known you of what now? About, I don't know, off and on, five years? More than that. I would, I would say we're getting closer to 10. Yeah, you know, I was trying to... Um, go back in history and look at all these tournaments and like I started with the ACO I believe it was in 2013 maybe 12 okay. maybe the end of 12 13 something like that and you were in there before I was not not by much I was around 2010 getting started okay yeah so you got a couple of years on me um got trying to find this I got all my cornhole archived on like three different Facebook pages. And I was trying to find all the photos and, you know, just trying to find some bits of information from each tournament I played in. And it was, it was hopeless, man. <laughs> <laughs> I still have a, I have a little separate hard drive sitting around here somewhere that I, I still have every bracket of every tournament I ever hosted somewhere. Oh, wow. Of brackets that you hosted. Yeah. Oh Yeah. Oh, well, that was the thing, man. Like me and you, we hosted a lot of tournaments. So I'm, you know, myself, I can't even count how many I hosted when you, now there's a lot of people out there listening to this and they're, they're wondering what in the hell are we talking about? Um, so cornhole is a sport. Um, a lot of people say it originated like a hundred years ago, somewhere in Kentucky, right? Um, <laughs> there, it's a board with a hole in it and then you take a bean bag and you throw it in there. Now, a lot of, you know, country folks played this in the Midwest and people do it at tailgating events now, concerts, barbecues. And it's actually, I wouldn't say blown up, but it's gotten its niche uh, in the country and all over the world where you can actually see this game being played on ESPN now, which is still mind blowing to me. Still mind blowing. Yeah. So, <laughs> but it's yeah. It's awesome to turn it on and see people, you know, that's pretty fun. <laughs> I can't remember what tournament it was, uh, but it was a PGA event. Tiger Woods is playing. It was like uh, it was his last event, I believe, like in November, October, something like that. And Tiger Woods was playing on a Sunday. The tournament went off, and then I saw Frank Maudlin playing cornhole right after Tiger Woods on ESPN. I was like, oh, my God, these guys are making it, man. <laughs> it's it's hard to believe, it's, and it's – it's almost becoming like it's just another thing now. Like, I mean, just two or three years ago, it was, you know, it was exciting to get that TV match. And it, I'm sure it still would be. I have not been fortunate to do enough to do that. But um, yeah. now it's almost like, oh, they're on TV again. But yeah. that's where you want to get, I guess. I, I guess, man. I mean, I've sat in the bars and watched Cornhole with, like you said, people that you have played against, people that you've actually beaten. And you're like, wow, I could yeah. be there too, you know. Um, so, you know, I've been wanting to do this podcast for a while, man. And, and something happened a couple of weeks ago that kind of like was a catalyst to me actually going on ahead and going through with this. I'll get into that later. But back in the day, you know, we both were with one of the organizations. So I look at it now. It's, it's the ACO and the ACL. Sure. I look at this like the WCW and the WWE, WWF, whatever you want to call it, whatever you liked to watch back in the day uh, sure. uh now we were both with the aco uh, pretty loyal uh we started out as officials and then eventually became commissioners so right. we always chatted back and forth in messenger and you know talked about the the current status of what's going on our opinions and blah 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 we were pretty outspoken in our little chats and even in uh the main official chat sure uh, um, <laughs> Now, what happened, I don't know, the ACO has been around since 2005 or something like that? I believe that's about right. When I got when I got started, I started in season six. So, yeah, it had been about two, 
they started around 2005, 2006. Yeah. Okay. Cause yeah, they, they haven't, they haven't been strictly one season per year. Remember they had one season there while we were there. It was only a couple months. Yeah, that's right. So they could shift the year to be in January start or something like that. Yeah. That was only a, a well, more than a couple of years ago, maybe like three or four years ago. Yeah. Cause I was still playing. We were, yeah, we were still playing when that happened. Um, so I look at it now, man, and the ACO should be where the ACL is. It, and, uh, the ACO is headed up by Frank Gears. You know, I my whole time in the ACO, um, I've never met a more classier guy. He never did anything. I, you know, a lot of people talk trash about Frank. Uh, yeah, I've never really had anything bad to say about Frank. He's always treated me fair. He's always gone above and beyond. <clears throat> Uh, him and Eric, actually, you know, Frank's flown me to Colorado with him to do tournaments, um, California, you know, I've got nothing bad to say about Frank or Eric, uh, Heinerman or Ryan LaBelle or any of those guys that run those ACO events. Um, right. Some, no, sometimes I didn't agree with everything that Absolutely. Frank did, but that's just part of the business. You're going to have people with opinions. And yeah. God knows I was opinionated back. <laughs> well, that's that's why we were there. Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, that's why you're trusted. That's why you're a commissioner. You know, uh, <laughs> we were at that time the best. I, you were the <clears throat> best at running tournaments in Virginia. You had the, you actually had a tournament that broke a Guinness World Record, right? Yeah, held a Guinness record for two years. Yeah. Two years, so it's beaten. Somebody got it. A group in Minnesota got it. Yeah. Well, son of a bitch. Yeah, I mean, there's back into it now. <laughs> I, 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 one time was good, <laughs> but but it was a, it was a lot of work. Uh, but the the Guinness rules were very specific, more than you would expect. Because so, I mean, we see the tournaments now that you know they easily have six, seven, eight hundred people or more, but it's across a bunch of divisions. To yeah. to have the Guinness record, it had to be everyone in one bracket, no divisions, no pools, no nothing. You know, one big bracket, play it out, and. Yeah. Um, and then on top of all that, you had all this record keeping and videoing. And I mean, down to things like I had to keep a video camera on every entrance and exit throughout the day to make sure nobody was leaving. Mm -hmm. And all that had to be submitted. It took me three months to submit the evidence to prove that we did it. <laughs> wow. And uh, when you when you try to make a record that way or when you try to break a record on your own, uh, Guinness will tell you that less than five percent of the attempts get approved, no matter whether you were successful or not. Yeah less than 5% gather the evidence needed correctly. Um, but we, but I got it. And, uh, the record was set in April and the record was certified in November that year. Wow. Get you a little certificate and everything. I did. I have a framed uh, certificate that will be going up in my new office soon. <laughs> oh, nice. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I've broken no records, bro. I got nothing impressive to follow that one up with. Thanks a lot. So. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. <laughs> oh man so <laughs> no your so, state tournaments were off the hook your north carolina state tournaments like you were on the leading yeah. edge of having a center court that was on tv every match or you know on a live stream every match you were you were ahead of the curve on that one i i don't know if too many people were doing what i was doing when i when i started it i mean i don't want to say i was an innovator for that but I do think I took the lead as like you were saying, like center court matches and, you yeah. know, doing like entrance music to players yep. and, you know, cause I kind of got like WWE into it a yeah. little bit. You yeah. Know, I like to yep. go above. People had the live stream things going where they'd yeah. stand behind the court and hold their phone, but you had a, a nice setup where it was standardized and all day long throughout the tournament key matches were played on that center court and people from all over the country were watching all day because North Carolina is full of stud players. Yeah. You, you had a, you had a very good thing with that state tournament. Well, I appreciate it, man. I, I thought we had a really good thing going, uh, you know, before there, before me, there was another guy that ran it, Matt Young, and then Matt mm -hmm. kind of went on his own way. And then I took it over and ran it for like three years. I, I guess I was known for, uh, cornhole in North Carolina for at least a couple of years, two or three years. Yeah. And now it passed on. I believe Chris Clark is doing it now. And um, I, I'm not going to say I, I miss it, but there are some aspects of it that, that I took from uh, running tournaments 
and I'm using today in the podcast world with the video cameras and software yeah. and stuff. So, you know, I, I'm really glad I had that opportunity to, to do that. You know, I learned a lot. So back in our time with the ACO, they really didn't have any competition at first. Yeah. There, there was uh, the, what the ACL is now. There was the Carolina Cornhole Tour, I believe. Uh, yeah. That was ran by the same guy, uh, Stacey. Yeah. I kind of did a little thing with them back in 2014 where I was one of their organizers, and that ended up being a flop. Then <laughs> there was, a, I believe, Joe Montgomery came around doing his tailgating for troops thing. Yeah. I participated in that a little bit and he disappeared. Uh, and now uh, Michael Meacham, who I'm going to call the ECW of cornhole. He's okay. Got, he's got That's his, a good analogy. He's got the CC, uh, is it the CCL, the crew yeah. cornhole league. He's actually doing really good, man. And uh, I'm happy for Mike. Cause I, I'm going to tell you when I first heard about this, I was like, man, this isn't going to go anywhere, but bless his heart. Because, you know, he had just finished his stint with the ACL, and I heard there was some drama with his departure, and I can fully yeah. understand that. Oh, so yeah. he's doing this out of anger. I don't know how long this is going to last, but, man, it's like national. He's got tournaments all over the East Coast. I don't know. I, I don't really follow Cornhole too much anymore. I just see, like, post every once in a while on Facebook. So I do know he's got tournaments up and down the East Coast. Are you yeah, I – a lot of the guys that I played with back around Virginia are into it and love it. Yeah. Uh, if I, if from everything I understand, he does an awesome job with it. No, oh, yeah, man. he's got some hella promos. I, yeah. You want to speak about my North Carolina tournaments, man. He actually one year took the microphone and you can still see this on YouTube, took the oh, microphone man. and introduced the uh, two competitors for the state championships. And, you know, he went, Michael Buffer. He went full Michael Buffer on this. Oh, man. Uh, oh, that was man. pretty cool. Um, you know, I <clears> tried <throat> to make a comeback this year, man. I uh, I missed it, I thought. Right. <laughs> so I was like, I'm going to try the ACL because, you know, it's like we were talking earlier. You see your buddies on ESPN. And you kind of want that a little bit, man. You want to yeah. get, get your clip on YouTube and post it on your Facebook and, you know, kind of brag a little bit. Look who's on ESPN. Uh so I played in a couple of ACL tournaments, man. And, you know, I think the skill was still there. You know, I left, I won a, a major in Charlotte in the ACO, my last competitive tournament. So I, I went out on a high. There you go. So, and when I played in the ACL regionals, <clears throat> I was still throwing good, man, without months of practice. Um, but my passion was gone. I just, yeah, I didn't like it anymore. You know, I, <sighs> I played, uh, you know, Leslie McGeever. I played mm -hmm. him, and he beat me 21 to nothing. And I was standing there just thinking to myself, and I was like, wow. I won my pool. I beat two top players that have always been top players. Then I lose one, and then I get smoked by one of the best players in North Carolina. And it yeah. was like, wow, this Don't is the same old, same old, same old bird. Same old, same old. So I was like, I really don't want to do this because I got a podcast now and I've got other things to focus on. So I finally yeah. just hung it up. How about you? Have you tested the waters? I, I have not. Um, I haven't played a tournament since July 2019. Um, oh, wow. Okay. So the, the last, the last like actual competitive Cornell I was doing, I did, I did join, um, I guess it would be the 2018, 2019 season as an ACL pro. Uh, -huh. uh joined with john uranski and we were tickled to death to play together uh we we had beaten on each other so many times it was time to team up <laughs> so uh, so we had a we had a good time playing the events we got to play yeah. um but kind of on my own i've been working to get to um it's been a kind of a dream of mine to always work for disney where i wanted to work at disney world and so i had been applying for years I, you know i started i actually turned in my first application the night that my wife and I got home from our honeymoon, which was in 2014, we honeymooned at Disney. And the night we got back, I turned in my first job application. I was like, I'm going, that's, it's going to happen eventually. Um, and then midway through that ACL pro season, uh, Mickey called. And so All I right. was gone. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it, at the beginning of that season, we actually filled out these um, kind of ACL pro bios mm -hmm. and I don't remember my exact phrasing. I tried to find it before I called you, but uh, yeah. I don't remember my exact phrasing, but it's in there that when Mickey calls, it's over. <laughs> <laughs>
you know, not, mm. not knowing it would ever happen because I'd been oh, trying yeah. for years, you know, I'd been trying yeah. for years and had zero luck, no interviews, no nothing. Mm. But when it happened, it, it happened hard and fast. It went from first phone call to me living in Florida in less than seven weeks. <laughs> uh, that's pretty fast. Well, I know you got a yeah. thing for Mickey, man, because I remember we were in Anaheim. Uh, you went to Disneyland when you were out there, didn't you? We did. We yeah. did. Uh, we played the we played the major in Anaheim, and Steve and I stayed an extra day and played around at Disneyland for a day. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, that was a uh, that was an infamous tournament. That's where I had to play you, and I, the score was fourteen to nine. I was looking at the scoreboard when I made that pose. You know, yeah. and I'm pretty sure I probably gave up the game right then. Or it was at least a four or a six pointer. Uh, Who knows? You had I, I know I know that exact point. You uh you had me dead to rights on that on that frame and just monked up the shot. <laughs> like you you, you had definitely... everything you ever wanted with that shot and just threw it out. And like I just remember being like, you know, whoa, got a freebie. <laughs> Man, that definitely sounds like something I would do. All right. <laughs> All right, let's get into the meat and potatoes of ACL, ACO. Okay. In your opinion, what do you think? Uh, why isn't the ACO where the ACL is? Now, if you think back, the ACO had some dealings with the ESPN. I remember them having, I, I can't remember where the major was, but ESPN was there doing a college football. Uh, oh, no, they did Sports Center. That was in Sports Tennessee. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They did sports center. I, Cause I recognize a couple of the, uh, uh, announcers there, commentators. Yeah. Um, that was in Knoxville. So what happened, man? What's your opinion on this? My opinion is that ACO actively decided not to accept it. Uh, I, I don't know the details. I was not a part of it. I'm not going to pretend to be a part of it, but, yeah. um, from my understanding, everything that, um, everything that, ACL has or had when they started with ESPN. I just, you know, just hearing things. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think I think ACO had every op every one of those same opportunities and actively turned it down. Yeah, you know, you hear rumors, you hear talk. You know, I've heard rumors that Frank was asking for too much from ESPN. You know, or. The thing was, greed was always brought up. But really, I didn't know that at, with Frank. I didn't know him as being greedy. Every time I've dealt with him, he's never been greedy. He's always paid for meals when we travel. He's always he's always been nice to me. Like, now sure. I can't speak how he runs his business. Um, right. I do think he was a little, maybe he was a little too nice. Because Stacy Moore has a complete different ideology when it comes to uh, cornhole. I don't think Stacy has a passion for the game. I think he has a passion for the business. Now, Frank, I think is a complete opposite. I think Frank has a passion for the game, but he likes it as a business. But I don't think, I think he would rather still play in tournaments and have a, for lack of a better term, a tailgating party across America, exactly. yeah. you know, than be big time on ESPN. Because I agree. I, yeah, I'm looking at everything he's got going on now, man. He's still popping out all these majors. He's still signing contracts with different cities. Uh, I've been out of the game a couple of years. All I see is, you know, people on Facebook and a lot of players I don't even recognize anymore. He's kept a lot of, like, the, um, the older players, I guess, that's been around for a while. But a lot sure. of new faces. It's, it's yeah. kind of all the superstars went over to ACL. You know, trying to be right. on TV. I mean, of course, yeah. Well, I mean, why wouldn't you if you had the if you had the chance? They lost me when they started in with all the majors. You know, I was maybe I was still a little uh, maybe I was still a little naive or a lot naive. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you know, I I enjoyed for me what kept me going is I enjoyed the you know the points chase. I enjoyed having only a few majors because you knew everyone would be there. Yeah. I mean, like to me, I didn't. Yeah, I mean, I knew I knew where I stood. Most of the time, I wasn't in danger of winning one of these big tournaments. I would have to be a special day for for me to get that far. You know, yeah. I, I knew that, understood that. Mm -hmm. But but the test was fun, and if I was going to make that test and go to the time, I wanted to test against all the best, not one or two that happened to make the trip that week. Um, so like that's yeah. that's where I started losing the interest. Is 
when the points didn't make sense anymore, you know? Yeah. Uh, Cause I mean, if you have, you have your tiers of tournaments, well, if you have, you know, your monthly regional tournament and there's nine of those in the season, but then you have 40 majors in a season, then that don't make any sense. Your points don't add up. Your systems don't work. You know, I was always, a, I'm sure you saw me say it a million times. I was a strong proponent for if it's possible for two people or two teams to tie at the end of a season in the ranking, no, tie is fine. But if it's possible to tie with a perfect score, something's wrong. Shouldn't be possible for more than one person to be perfect in a ranking yeah. system. Yeah. Doesn't make and any sense. I agree. And <clears throat> if it's changed, uh, I'm going to go ahead and preface this. If, this. if the ranking system's changed, like I said, I haven't been in it in three years. I don't know. It could have changed. So if you're calling me an asshole know. right now <laughs> while we're talking about this, you're calling me a Toby assholes. <laughs> we don't know what we're talking about. Because, yeah, that was when it was we, we were in back about three, four years ago. Right. That's how it was. So if it's changed, we apologize. We're just talking about um, what we know. And that was yeah. what got me to. And I, you know, what? I benefited from this, too. Uh, Absolutely. I did. You, I, know, you, I, you knew you could go to tournaments and you kind of you could kind of gauge the crowd a little bit and mm -hmm. see who was going to be there and look at your competition and, and everyone did it and everyone was crazy if they didn't. Yeah. I mean, I drove to Indiana. I drove <laughs> to Mississippi just to get points, man. I'm not even yeah. going to lie. Yeah. Just to get points to play. I had a great time. I loved uh, visiting with all the friends that I made playing cornhole, but I wasn't going to drive to a place where I knew that all the kingpins were going to be there. You know, right. I was going to pick and choose. I mean, hell, I got a, a 30 finish that one season where they were, had like 30 majors in a season. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah the, last, the last season that I really chased points uh, would have been that year we were in Anaheim. Mm -hmm. And um, right at the beginning of that season, uh, Steve, Steve Wimmer, who's my doubles partner for years, yeah. uh, him and his wife found out they're pregnant. And so we knew this was it. Like, as, as he should, he was not going to play once they had a kid. Yeah. And, you know, I, you know, I would be mad if he did, you know, like, no, stay home, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. have fun. That, that's real fun. You know, this is just, just take that bag out of your hand quick. man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we, so we knew that was our last going to be our last run at it as a double team. So we made the most out of it and we went everywhere we wanted to go. We, you yeah. know, we did Anaheim and Vegas. We, I think back then you counted your best three events and all of our, I think our best threes was a, a pair of wins and a third or something like that. You know, we yeah. had a real good year and it, I mean, it was a lot of fun, but yeah, we took advantage of the system for sure. Oh, played, yeah, uh, man. played where we knew we could play. I'd do it again too. If I could, if I was mm -hmm. playing, <laughs> anybody would. Yeah. So, you know, like a lot of players left ACO, man, it just like those wrestlers were leaving WCW and going to WWE. Yeah. Bigger and better things, you know, and that's kind of what I did. That's kind of what, uh, I don't think I burned any bridges with the ACO, but there's a couple of guys over there. I really don't care for, and I don't want to see them anymore because sure. all they do is talk behind your back. And, uh, but anyway, yeah. so yeah, I got a, else. I got a nice dose of that when I left, they, uh, yeah. <laughs> they didn't under, they apparently don't understand how Facebook group permissions work. So, <laughs> so I, <laughs> I got to see a few hours of what they all really thought when I went ACL pro that who knows if they knew I was still sitting there watching it all unfold or not, but maybe yeah. one day they'll learn to use the page. I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully. Well, some of these people really aren't that smart, bro. So I'm going to put that out there right now. I said that not Toby folks, take it out with me. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, a lot of players left, man. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of what, uh, you know, like I was saying before, that's kind of, <clears throat> I wasn't going to do that. I've always been ACO. I was ACO loyal, this man. I Absolutely. was one of the yeah, last too. ones, you know, to kind of like, I saw, I saw the players on ESPN and the ACL and I was being a realist. I was like, wow, the ACL is taking the ball and running here, man. And ACO is still stagnant and they're just doing the national tailgating tour. And yeah with no plans of ESPN, there was rumors of like an NBC thing, Fox, and nothing ever came to fruition that I know of. I've never seen the ACO on TV. So it's like you said, maybe Frank's just completely done with that idea. And he's just going with what he's got. 
I mean, um, for, for years, we were told directly that goal number one, put cornhole on TV. I truly believe that when it came time to put up or shut up, that it didn't happen. That's yeah. from every, from the few people I've heard that actually, you know, that have real knowledge of it. That's how I understand that it was an active choice to no, we're not doing it or no, we're not ready or maybe not willing to pay for the production. Cause mm-hmm. I mean, all that, every bit of it costs a lot of money. You know, it's, you, yeah. you're talking tens of thousands of dollars or more, you know, in cameramen, production time, the crews, all that setup, all the equipment. And, and you haven't even put it on TV yet. The airtime's expensive. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think it was a gamble that Frank just didn't want to take. Yeah. And I see what the ACL's done. They took that gamble and they got a major sponsor in Johnsonville. I don't yeah. really, and I think Johnsonville's probably, you know, getting uh, some pretty good promotions off of this. Johnsonville's on everything cornhole in the ACL. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, I've going to a uh, food line, man. And Johnsonville Broads, first thing I think of is damn ACL. What the hell? So it's working. They got me. Yeah, the consumer. Working. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think that's what happened. They invested. And in, I mean, they're evolving every season with their ESPN production. Shot cameras, the slow-mo, yeah. Trey's commentary is probably best I've heard in Cornhole. And me and you, that's saying a lot because me and you did some good commentary in the ACO. <laughs> back in I had the- a... I had a ball doing that. I, I, I mean, too. It was I was fun. thinking about that earlier. So earlier today, I watched your podcast with Trey, you know, and he was talking yeah. about how he uh, how he got started and did his tape and everything. I ain't gonna lie. I'd love to call one, man. sit right there with him and do it. I'd love it. I'd have a he's, ball. He's a master at it, man. I've sat and watched his. He describes every shot the right way, the spin and uh, Trey's a good dude, man. Like um, there's there's a few guys over in the ACO that I really don't care for, which is, I mean, it's no big yeah. secret. That's okay. no big secret. Um, <laughs> I'm not a big fan of Stacy Moore's because he kind of did me wrong a couple of times. And, uh, oh, no. you know, back when I was his uh, CO commissioner or whatnot for the Carolina Cornhole Tour. But anyway, I'm oh, never okay. playing in the ACL, so it is what it is. But Trey, man, I got no issues with Trey. He's stand-up dude, man. God, great announcer. But, yeah, they've got, like, sideline reporters and – the i don't know it looks like such a great production they got a hot sideline reporter bro you seen that girl good gracious <laughs> oh the one from a couple years ago <laughs> oh yo oh she's not up there now oh man no. i need to start watching acl a little a little bit more now damn why they get rid of her that was uh, a shining star she's she got a, a i think she's in vegas i tell you one thing that boggles my mind is the attitudes that these players are getting now man uh, the ones that are going to ACL, and I, I I can't say I wouldn't be doing it too. Who knows? I know my personality. I wouldn't take it as far as some of these people are taking it. Right. You know, I had a Mike Bird uh, professional cornhole Facebook page way before a lot of these people did. So I know that's <laughs> me. I did that kind of shit. You know, I made one. <laughs> okay. Now everybody's making them. Uh, everybody's sure. getting sponsors. That's awesome. I love it. Some yes. people are actually getting agents. Okay. Yeah. People people have been playing <laughs> cornhole for years without agents. Now all of a sudden you need an agent. Um, yeah. I mean, it's not like I'd like to see the numbers on the ESPN views. I mean, are these people yeah. putting themselves on the same level as like Pete Weber and these professional bowlers or uh because we're not even going to say they're on like the big five level, the big four level. You like golf, <laughs> hockey, football, basketball, baseball. Yeah, no. I won't mention the players' names, but <laughs> I, I contacted two players and I asked them if they wanted to be on the podcast. Sure. Now, one I asked last year and he was like, Yeah, man, no problem. I'll do it. Let's schedule it. So I scheduled it and uh, I messaged him the day before, or the day of. And he said he couldn't do it, that we needed to reschedule. I was like, no problem, bro. We'll reschedule. And the other one, I asked if he wanted to be on it. And I had actually interviewed this guy before at an ACO event. There was no, no issues. Both of them told me that I needed to – one of them said he was going to ask his agent and see if it was okay. Never heard back from him. The other one put me in a group chat with his agent 
and uh, the agent never contacted me back. So I was like, okay, well, okay. I don't want an interview that bad. I, you know, <laughs> I just had an NFL player and a baseball player on my podcast a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> so uh, I'm good. We'll, we'll hold out on cornhole. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't, I don't know if we're quite there yet, but I mean, uh, I, I can, I can tell you back when I was starting, you know, and people, you know, people around Roanoke where I was would ask like, <clears throat> like, why are you so serious about it? Or why are you putting so much time into it? And, you know, I would always tell them, you know, any of it can be as big as you want it to be. It can be as serious as you want it to be. Like if you set the tone and you set the example, people will follow. And I mean, I think, I think that's why Cornhole in uh, like Roanoke area where I was, I think that's why it blew up because, you know, I did try my best to set up professional example. And I think a lot of people were into it and it seemed to spread. It seemed to grow. And, you know, I had my club star city cornhole and, you know, it's still kind of, it still kind of kicks around on its own now, but it's, <laughs> it's different of course, yeah. but. Um, well, you had star city cornhole. I had triangle cornhole. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Still got t-shirts and stuff from all that. <laughs> yeah. I Dang. still, uh, I still put bags out there and sell them now every once in a while, just with the star city stuff, just to kind of maybe a little nostalgia, maybe a little bit of, Maybe yeah. I just want some bags. <laughs> you know, just uh... That's another thing, man. Let's talk about bags because right now you can go to the ACL's website. They have 46 different manufactured bags, 46 different brands you can choose from. Now the ACO has five. <laughs> and yeah. out of those five, you can probably only play in tournaments with three of them. So they have something called the Founder Series Bags. Then they have uh, another one called the ACO Gamble and Finn Bags. Uh, that must be, I know Finn. Oh, Finn, he did, yeah. He did a podcast. I don't know who Gamble is. That's somebody new. Um, well, new to me anyway. Then they've got the ACO Pro 450 Canvas Bags. But I think that's one thing that the players really liked is being able to bring their own bags to ACL tournaments. I think so too. I, I'm a, I'm a fan of bringing your own bags for my number one reason is I don't want to touch the same scuzzy bags that everybody's had their hands on all day. <laughs> yeah. You couldn't do uh, that now anyway. <laughs> oh, I've, I've been to too many tournaments and watched too many of these guys roll in and out of the bathroom without washing hands. Nope. Picking nope. the nose. Oh yeah. Yeah. Nah. I'd rather have my own bags. Yeah. I can wash them when I get home. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I like it for that part, but I do think it's a different skill test when everyone's using the same bag too. I think that's definitely a, it's not like the definitive show of skill, but it's a different show of skill. Yeah. So it's, so it's kind of a question of what do you want? Do you want everybody throwing the same thing and see who adapts the best? Or do you want everybody throwing what they like and seeing who's the best at their optimum choice? I guess. Well, um, believe it or not, cornhole is a game of strategy. So, <laughs> I mean, you have to think sometimes, which I didn't do a lot of when I was playing, <laughs> but um, the bag has changed so much. I don't know if you want to call it evolved or has the bag devolved. I don't know. But the bags yeah. that they play with now, we could talk an hour about bags, man, because yeah. I've heard and seen some crazy <clears throat> stuff when it comes to these bags they have. These game changer bags, and there's – other bags do the same thing, but they're so loose. And the bags now, you don't have to throw them straight. You can be off by a couple inches to the left, a couple inches to the right, and the bag will catch the hole and just slide right in. Now, the bags that we started throwing with, the 450 China bags, you know, the pillows Ooh. and whatnot, yeah. you didn't strategize with those because you <laughs> had to throw them straight. They yeah. would not go in the hole unless you throw them straight. And still, they weren't guaranteed to go in the hole. They were – known to clog yeah i don't even know if you can clog the hole with the bags nowadays and if uh if you get a bag or a group of bags i guess that will stop in the hole now like everybody acts like that's a bad thing which i mean to me i see a six inch bag a six inch hole why do you expect five or six of them to fall through at the same time <laughs> I, something doesn't add yeah. up to me but uh, yeah i i go back and forth with bags um the one the one thing though is uh you know from the early days with the China bags to now with whatever bag you want, 
if we're being honest, the same guys are at the top. You know, a few people, a few people will sneak in on a hot day. You know, mm-hmm. they'll have a, you know, an a, a plus game day, and sneak into that top group. But the ones that are winning now are the same ones that were winning ten years ago when I started, and probably long before that too, with whatever bag you put in their hand. <laughs> Do you think these bags make them even more unbeatable? Uh, I don't. I think it adds a little parity to the game. I think it. I think it gives the lesser skilled player a, a fighting chance more than the old bags did. Because they can, you know, they can have a day like maybe they're throwing real straight, but they can't get the bag flat. Well, it'll still collapse on the board and fall in. Or um, so like I know for me, I I used to like to take I would take a set of sticky bags and a set of fast bags with me to tournaments. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would just if I was having a good day, I'd throw the sticky bags because I could push them around and block and shove and all that stuff. But if I was having a bad day, I bring out the slick bags and just play a straight shot all day long and don't get fancy and hope that it was enough to hang on. Uh, you didn't have that option in the China bag days. <laughs> you do, you do make a good point. It's still the same people, still <laughs> the same top 10 with a couple of people that have broken in sure. um, like Jamie Graham. You know, I remember when Jamie was getting beat at my regionals and I don't know what he did. He took the cornhole steroids and within yeah, a year, did. this guy is not missing. Um, he just he exploded like when he got good he got he got good incredible good and it felt like overnight i don't know how he did this weekend because the aco just had an event in florida right was that Uh, that yeah acl was down here this weekend yeah yeah so i don't know i do know that one of the one damon dennis won it and he's been around forever top of his game that dude i saw him make uh the airmail box made like 10 12 in a row i was like good gracious but he's he's got an airmail that's hard to top i've yeah. i've been the victim of that more times than i care to admit <laughs> yeah. i'm glad he uh he won that he's one mm-hmm. of the one guys i really like over there i mean there's a lot of people that i like and i consider friends to this day to play cornhole but there's a lot over there i'm like man this guy's arrogant this guy's an asshole you know fucking wearing that hat that shirt come on man put your beer down jesus christ you know you're on tv sir <laughs> and i i don't know i the season i went went with acl pro i just wanted i just wanted to play i wanted to experience it i wanted mm-hmm. to be a part of it like i i had been fortunate enough to to get a esp and three match a time or two i think twice maybe yeah. um <laughs> took a took a royal whooping both times and <laughs> but that happened that happens when you play that guy on a on a big stage so yeah oh and, well. and- and Matt, he was uh, in the ACO, and he just went over to the ACO this year. That's mm-hmm. that's like Hulk Hogan, you know, yeah. in the WCW and teaming up with the NWO, bro. That was the that was the big move right there when Matt Guy went over to ACO. Yeah, yeah. I was I was surprised. I I mean, I honestly thought he was locked to ACO, you know, just just on a personal level, you know, him and Frank being buddies, and I'm sure they still are. I'm sure they talk that through I'm, yeah. I'm sure it wasn't just dropped on him but yeah yeah you can't even hate on him for doing it man because matt's won so many aco championships man he walks around with that belt and this is what he wants man that i'm not going to say he wants the recognition but he deserves it for being that yeah. good in the sport he deserves to be on a national stage you know and get some national uh, t- tv time good for him yeah. man because a lot of these people are doing it that haven't been playing for that long, you know, and haven't really won anything. So if the ACO is not going to put Matt on spotlight, you got to go to where the spotlight is. He, he outgrew him. I think it's okay to say that he definitely outgrew it. You know, yeah. the rest of the, the rest of the top, top, top competition had gone. Of yep. course, there's always, there's always players on both leagues that have the ability to, you know, to come in on a good day and, or even some of them, their average days. There's some really good ones still playing ACO, but yeah, it was he had he had outgrown it for yeah. sure. Man, I think don't know about how... this. Think about this. As long as there has been a King of Cornhole tournament, this summer will be the first time we have a King of Cornhole tournament without Matt. Oh wow, really? He's been what? there for everyone. So how does that's right? Because if you're a signed pro with the ACL. <clears throat> can't compete in another faction or another organization, right? Right. 
Wow. So he's no. Wow. I don't even really know who plays in the ACO anymore. I could tell you everybody because they do a good job marketing and promoting their players. I will give ACO that. ACO, I couldn't tell you, man, who their top players are. I I recognize a few faces, but I don't know. Yeah. It, I've talked to a few people and they're all saying they're they're giving it up, you know. Yeah, I know I know a few of my buddies from Roanoke are doing really well. Yeah. Uh, but I, I couldn't tell you how I couldn't tell you how they stand as far as like a national ranking or anything, mm -hmm. but I mean they're they're always on the live stream videos, which is fun to watch, and they seem to be playing well, so it's it's fun to see them. Well, I stand behind it, man. I, I still – I haven't talked to Frank in a while. I haven't talked to Frank in a couple of years. I got no hard feelings <laughs> with Frank. I think he's a good person, man. He's passionate for the sport. Uh, I mean, he loves what he does, so he's not working. Whenever you can do something you love, you're never working. So sure. I hope that one day, man, something happens and the ACO takes off and somehow roles are reversed. And they get a get something big if that's what Frank wants. If that's not what he wants, then hey man, I hope he keeps going strong with what he's doing. Yeah, I I kind of think he's where he wants to be now. Yeah. Which which is uh sad in a way because I don't think that's where it started. I don't think that's what the goal was when he started. It's, at least that's mm -hmm. not what he openly said the goal was when we were when we were becoming officials and becoming commissioners. That I mean, it was yeah. it was pretty clear the goal was to put cornhole on TV and and then I think when it came down to it, either either he wasn't ready or maybe the money was not right or mm -hmm. not money given to him. It, it's going to cost. No one was ever going to put Cornhole on TV on their dime. It was going to have to be the league that was going to put them up was going to pay for it. That was always going yeah. to be the case. Yeah. It was a it's a pipe dream to think otherwise. Now, I believe sponsors are probably footing the bill <laughs> because it Most has definitely. proven itself. But yep. um, to get it started, that was never going to be the start. And I think that's where ACO dropped the ball. Uh, this is my humble opinion on what happened. And people are probably going to say Mike Bird's full of shit, but I don't care. I think that people didn't take the ACL serious. I don't think that they were thought of as a threat because they were that tailgating league that played that mega event once a year in North Carolina. Oh, yeah. And they, they were the mega gate. Wasn't that what it was called? Yeah, I did Mega Gate. It was it was actually fun, but <laughs> it was yeah. different. It was very different, but it um because it had so much stuff. But yeah, yeah, so, and, it was different. And then that tanked. So yeah. then, then they went with the Carolina Cornhole Tour. Uh, that eventually tanked. So when the ACL appeared, I think that I'm not saying maybe Frank, but I, I think that just ACL in general didn't take it serious. You know, didn't see it as a threat. And maybe they didn't press the ESPN deal like they should have. Maybe they should have taken it more serious if they wanted to be on ESPN. And I think Stacy Moore had the connections. Uh, he definitely had the connections. He had the money backing. And yeah. they just gambled, went for it. And now, like you said, I don't think they have a problem with sponsors. I bet they could get somebody else big like Johnsonville because they've proven that they must be putting up numbers on ESPN to be coming back season after season. Yeah, and I mean they, they have to be. They're not gonna they're not gonna keep welcoming you back if you're not producing. I mean, oh, yeah. that's not what they're in the business to do. Yeah, and it's like you said earlier. I'm sure that a production like they put on is thousands of dollars for one show. And one thing that stands out to me is that you know you have like Johnsonville for multiple seasons. Think. Mm. Think about it before Johnsonville. Do you remember any sponsor with any cornhole league that hung on for more than a season? I mean, you want to talk about little bitty sponsors like uh, any like the, the whole light? Did, and, did uh, anyone stay? Did anyone stay for more than a season? And I think that's no. because they weren't getting what they were promised. And I think that was one of ACO's big downfalls is overpromising. We could talk about payouts. I think the lack of money. <laughs> you know, that probably deterred a lot of players, too. It could, but I would – I'm still – so I'm, I'm a big – I'm a big proponent of disconnecting entry fees and payouts. Yeah. I don't think there should be a connection. When you pay an entry fee, mm -hmm. you're not paying for a prize. You're paying for Michael Bird's time, his equipment, his laptop, his cameras, um, his expertise – 
you know, to run an event for two or three days. And you're paying for the time he spent before planning the event, the time he'll spend after cleaning up the event, you know, the time he'll spend reporting results and paying for points to be entered for different people. And that, to me, that's what your entry fee pays for. Uh, I don't think, I don't think throwing a bag in a hole is worth getting paid for unless you're providing something in some way. Now, if you're playing on a ESPN and people are watching and getting entertainment, now you're providing something. People yeah. are having fun watching you. Now the story's changed. But, you know, as far as anything else leading up to that, maybe I'm old fashioned, but <laughs> you, you have to provide something if you want to get paid for it. Get off my lawn, Toby Smith. I, I'm terrible. <laughs> I'm terrible. I, I, I feel the same way, man. But it's like this back in the day when you ran a blind draw or you went to an event. And like you said earlier, you scope out the crowd. <clears throat> Cornhole is one of the easiest sports where you can call probably the championship match before the tournament even starts. You know who's going to be there. You know who's going to be in the championship. You know who's got a chance to win. You know who's going to beat you. You know yeah. who you've never beat. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. so when people pay their membership and I was guilty for paying out too off of buy-ins, you, it's like, okay, player A's here, player A's kick ass. So I'm collecting all this money for player A today. Mm -hmm. you know, this, this is player A's payout and pretty much you knew he was going to win. Yeah. But, biggest, I, I tell, I just told somebody this earlier or last week that the biggest mistake I ever made running tournaments was to run a tournament with a hundred percent payout. Biggest mistake anyone ever made running a cornhole tournament. Yeah. And, and, and another thought is why I'm stealing this idea. This is not my idea, by the way, but <laughs> when did a hundred percent payout not mean every player gets paid? Why did, why is that not what hundred percent payout means? Um, but no, that's you know, true. I mean, people, people automatically jump to hundred percent payout means hundred percent of entry fees. Well, why is it hundred percent of entry fees? I mean, what, what's the, what's the connection? So lately I've, you know, so anyone that's, you know, anyone that's listening to us here and doesn't follow or have a lot of Cornell players on their social media, they don't see that there are these kind of discussions on social media all the time with everybody mm -hmm. wanting to throw in their two cents of how a tournament should work, how their buddies do it, mm -hmm. how, you know, whatever else. And it's, it's endless and it's, um, it's you circular. Mean, it's been the same thing for years. You mean it still goes on, Toby? Really? They still yes. are arguing about how to run tournaments. Absolutely. <laughs> it and uh, it's in some ways it's even more absurd than it used to be. And I've paid. <laughs> I did really. I did so good of not paying attention to any of it <laughs> from from <laughs> July 2019 to April 2020. Uh, I will say that I'm very thankful that the popularity of people collecting bags has has let me get through the furlough and layoffs that I've been through. Uh, I want to talk to you about super that. Super thankful about that. I want to talk uh, to you about that. Okay. What in the hell started that? I Like I've said, I've been out for a <laughs> while. So there was, when I left, there was the Reynolds bags. There was the beer belly bags. What was yeah. another one back then, three years ago? I, uh, BG was around. BG still. was around. BG's uh, not, been through a lot of changes since then. But now... I was at a ACO regional here uh, that Chris Clark threw um, probably late last year. It was like their second regional. There was a, a white set of those game changers there. Okay. Somebody spent 500 freaking dollars on a set of four bags. Oh, it, was yeah. a, it was a collector's edition set. Oh, yeah. What in the hell is going on that people are paying $500 for a set of four? I don't know. There, so – so $500, you're just scratching the surface. I watched a set of game changers. I watched a set of four used game changers get sold for $1,400 a couple of months ago. And game Unreal. changers, game changers, is, that's Frank Maudlin's bag, right? He designed that yeah. one. Yeah, good yeah. job, Frank. Damn, good, good job. I hope you're getting like some royalties or you must have a big contract with your bag <laughs> manufacturer or something. I, God. His name's on every one of them. So he's doing something good. Pretty Damn. awesome. What is it because, a, because of the color? They're like uh, 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 not not many of these type made or like in a collection. All right. <laughs> Sorry, so uh, so I I've definitely upset some folks with my opinion on game changers on these threads. So I, I'm personally a fan of the bag. I like it. I can throw yeah. it pretty well. Um, these guys that collect these bags will tell you that 
there are different generations of game changers. That might be true. Hmm. If it is true, I don't think the people that make the bags have any idea. <laughs> I think it's completely made up by the guys that are raffling these bags and selling these bags. And so I can tell you what the differences are. And it's, it's gotten so ridiculous now that they'll define like generation two versus generation three by counting the number of stitches around the patch. And they'll pretend that the number of threads around the patch makes a difference in that bag. That's how crazy it is. I can tell you the only real difference with Game Changers. When Game Changers were first made, they were made with a base white fabric. So the entire bag was printed. And you, you've seen it. Everyone has their own thing printed on the back. It's fun. Everybody likes it. Yeah. Um, when Game Changers started, they started with, uh, you know, the fabric was white. They printed the entire thing. At some point, and I don't know why, I'm not going to pretend to know why, but I do have a background as a manufacturing engineer. So I'm guessing it was a cost-saving move to buy the fabric already printed in the base color and then only print black ink on it. Because <clears throat> if you order Game Changers today, that's what you can do. You can't do full color custom. You can only print black ink. So that tells me they're printing on a base color, color fabric. And you can feel the difference in that base color fabric versus the ones that were the old white fabric. And I have sets of both sitting around here. You can definitely tell a feel difference. For whatever reason, the manufacturer doesn't like to use that white fabric anymore. Maybe, it, maybe it's not as strong. Maybe it's not as durable. Maybe it's harder to get. Maybe the printing costs too much. I don't know. But uh, mm. that's been the major change is when they switch from that white fabric to a base color fabric. Somewhere along the way, these guys that collect bags <laughs> decided to divide the bags into generations that do not line up with that change. <laughs> they don't line up with the actual change that happened. <laughs> wow. But, it, you know, whatever floats their boat, it's their money. If they're happy and they enjoy it, that's fine. Wow. So, I mean, so we we both know Troy Blackjack Cornhole really well. Yeah. Um, his his first couple runs of Game Changers um, were the full color color full color custom type, and those are the ones. Those are some of the ones that get the most money. Like the ones I was telling you about with the fourteen hundred, they were a set of Blackjack bags. And um, there's, I don't know the guy personally, but he you know he shares his picture of his collection on Facebook a lot. It, I, we're talking thousands of dollars in game changers that are not being played with just sitting in a collection. I mean, I don't understand it, but you know, I, I collect stuff too that people don't understand. That's fine. So he's but, got bags just sitting around, just being on display for him to see. Not people playing are making, them. people are making frames and shadow boxes to hang their favorite bags on the wall instead of playing with them. Wow. The game has really changed, man. I don't get it, I, but it, I, it's okay. <laughs> I mean, I can understand doing that to a baseball bat or a glove from a famous player or something, but yeah, I'm not going to buy a brand new baseball or a brand new <laughs> baseball glove and just put it on a mantle somewhere <laughs> and be like, this was my, this is my brand new Louisville uh, slugger. <laughs> yeah. These aren't even new bags. Somebody else has already uh, used them and beat them up. They'll still oh my pay them gosh. crazy money. These bags right here were played with by Frank Maudlin, the guy that made Game Changers. <laughs> Can you believe it? I'm framing them right now. <laughs> that happens. That really happens. Oh, man. Damn, I mean, bro. It, we, but, we were I still mean, playing. It yeah. is funny. It is funny, but in a way, that's where you want it to go. If uh, if you want things to take off, that's the way you want people to feel about it, in, you yeah. know, in a way. <clears throat> I mean, I'm making fun of it, but, you know, I, if I had that opportunity, I would – I would have some bird changers out there. Yeah. <laughs> I would yeah. have some bags with my full hawk on it. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah. Hell, we might be signing bags, making a few dollars. You never know, oh, man. man. <laughs> I mean, the only way I'm going back to Cornhole, bro, is if you team up with me and then we'll do this. Oh, man. I, we'll be the, we'll be the just... outsiders. I think we <laughs> talked about this a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just don't have the desire to travel for it anymore. Like, I don't so, know. you know, I spent so many years using every vacation day for a cornhole tournament. Yeah. And then the one year that I didn't do that, I, you know, I took a season off. I took a season away from traveling before I switched to ACL pro. And uh, I just didn't go to any tournament that was outside of like an hour away. And it was so nice. It was so yeah. nice to have my vacation time to do what I wanted. And um, my wife and I could go on trips and, not have to chase beanbags and 
<laughs> I don't see how it could go back. Yeah. Couldn't go back. <laughs> what? And so, the, all right. There's some more ridiculous stuff I want to get to. I, I heard about people boiling their bags now. <laughs> I've heard about this. Yeah. They boil their bags because it breaks them in. Even. Yeah. I guess that's, you ever play softball? I mean, you play a lot of yeah. recreational softball. You know how people put them, they roll them. And, you know, mm -hmm. their composite bat flattens out completely because it's like yes. the equivalent of hitting the ball 800 times. So maybe yeah. this is the equivalent of the bag hitting the board 800 times and then breaks it in. Sounds know. ridiculous, man. I have no idea. Yeah, I, it's a bit ridiculous. Um, they'll they'll boil the bags and then wonder why they fall apart next week. It's <laughs> it gets it makes me crazy to hear it and, and see it. And, the, you know, luckily now the guys making bags are putting that on their websites. Like if you, if you boiled your bags, we're not warranting it, warranting them anymore. And, you know, that's correct. Cause no. that, that boiling is doing a lot more to those bags. than these guys realize those, those fabrics have binders and things in them to hold the threads together for a reason. Mm -hmm. And if you're boiling all of that out, you're not breaking in the bag anymore. You're, I mean, you're liquefying the bag, <laughs> you know, at some point. What do you what do you think about this uh, venom that you're supposed to put on your bags now? Um, was it <laughs> oh, the you bag, said it was like uh, the bag no, serum? Bag serum. I think Ryan LaBelle told me it was like fabric softener. <laughs> it, uh, I okay, so I've never tried it. Um, I don't plan to try it, but I've read on a lot of places now that it's hair conditioner. Like you go in the shower and grab your wife's hair conditioner mm. and that's what this stuff is um so maybe that's that, what he told me it was if that's really if that's really what's going on then kudos to the guy who thought about taking his 99 cent bottle of suave and turning it into 30 or 40 dollars good for that guy <laughs> he's the same guy that probably took his old gym gloves and started wearing them throwing a bag and said hey you know what i can make cornhole gloves oh my oh my what do you think the glove actually helps? I've, I've only throw a bag with a glove on. Yeah, I don't think I could handle it. I, I've I've talked to one one good friend who I think it does help him. He's you know he's told me that his hands sweat really bad, and it helps mm. him keep the bag feeling the way he wants. I, I'll completely buy that. I'm I'm on board with that one. But other other than that, I haven't heard anybody else have a real use for it other than you know comfort or superstition uh, man is there anything we could invent out of something that's already made and just mm. change the color of it and call it the cornhole how about like a muscle shirt the cornhole shirt like uh I, we could <laughs> make it with some torque in like the left shoulder and kind of like spring loaded shoulders <laughs> yeah i can't i can't tell you how bad i've wanted to uh <clears throat> you know i've made the joke with some people to i mean everyone's heard of snake oil you know yeah. somebody selling yeah. snake oil when they're selling just nonsense if somebody made a bag break-in serum called snake oil it would be the ultimate <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well how could, sounds, how could you top it that would be uh, cornhole sounds like we need to get on that man <laughs> we need to get on that like uh, we talked about bags and uh you said something about stepping over the line What's yeah that, 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 that seems to be a a little bit of a hot point but if you're comparing the leagues um, so I still, I still talk to a lot of my guys, uh, my players from Roanoke and they asked, they asked me my opinion on this, that, and the other, even though I'm not involved really anymore, it's, you know, it is flattering that they'll ask, but mm -hmm. one difference right now is ACO has gone back to the rule of you can't step over the line until your bag hits the opposite board. And, and that's a good, that's a good move in my opinion, um, you and I were both there when the rule changed. That is the original way the rule was, is that you had to stay both feet behind the line until the bag hit the opposite board. While we were there, that rule changed because of Dayton. You remember Dayton? Yeah, yeah. Um, there were grown men. So for, for anyone seeing the podcast, doesn't know Dayton Weber. Dayton has no legs from the knees down and no arms from the elbows down and still is one of the top corner players out there by any by any measurement partnered with him in vegas and uh uh we played a cedro herrera and uh the, that windsor kid ryan windsor yeah yeah and uh we had him we had him man and guess who <laughs> choked oh no this guy 
<laughs> I did not do Dayton any favors there. We actually oh, no. played in uh, Virginia too, in that yeah. volleyball arena on the turf. And uh, oh yeah, I yeah, we had that. a really good, really good team there. But yeah, get back to Dayton. So yeah, Dayton. sorry, but yeah, so we the rule changed for him because the way he throws, he kind of lunges himself forward. And sometimes, not every time, but sometimes he would land beyond the line. And there were actually grown men coming to ACO and saying, Dayton is stepping over the line as he throws the bag, and that's cheating. So, so think about that. These grown men are saying that a young man with no feet is stepping over the line and cheating in a cornhole game. <laughs> To me, that's absurd. I, I'm sorry, that's absurd. But anyway, that's the reason the rule was changed, was for yeah. Dayton. And and Dayton did not care. Back at that time when the rule was being changed in ACO, uh, Eric asked, I'm pretty sure it was Eric, but Eric asked Dayton, and Dayton did not care, did not want the rule changed. He said, I'll back up and keep winning. I don't doubt that a bit. Sure he yeah. would. I, I absolutely believe he would have. And uh, But rule was changed anyway. No one took advantage of that until a couple of seasons ago, some players started, they'll call it following through, but they throw the bag in such a way that they release the bag and their foot crosses over and steps way past the line just as they're releasing the bag. So by rule, they're okay. You know, they're releasing the bag before anything touches beyond the line, but they are throwing the bag as they cross the line. And it, the biggest thing is that it looks bad. Like if you ask me my mm-hmm. opinion, the, that's the thing is that it looks bad. Yeah. Um, so like, say, say you go to a tournament and a, it's, you know, it's a local mom and pops fundraiser tournament and a couple pros show up and they're, they're into that top, that style of throw. If these guys that don't play tournament cornhole, see these guys stepping over the line as they throw, what are they going to think? The pros are cheating us. Yeah. They're not going to understand. They're not going to take that minute to, they're not, they're just not going to get it. And that point that point has been proven to me over and over and it was proven to me this weekend uh my father-in-law was watching some of the cornhole with me and someone on one of the broadcasts was doing one on one of the espn broadcast espn three broadcasts was stepping through on their follow-through and he i mean my father-in-law has seen me play a lot he gets it he looked right at me and said why is that guy allowed to cheat I said, well, and so I explained to him how the rule and everything work, works. And he's like, well, that's just such a bad look. I didn't tell him that. That was all stuff he said to me. And, no. But that's what the average viewer is going to see when they see people stepping over the line. And uh, So in the ACL, it's legal to take a step over the line? Yeah, at the moment it is. At the moment. I don't, it's I don't think as many people are doing it now. I, yeah. think it's kind of, I think it was kind of a fad that's fading. Um, I, I haven't seen that many people still doing it, but it, it still happens. I've watched uh, some YouTube videos of some ACL ESPN footage, and I, I'm not going to mention the player's name, but it's a prominent player. I've seen step over the line and start walking to the other board as the other guy is still throwing his last back. Yeah, that's not good. And I'm like, wow, okay. They let him get away with that stuff. That's annoying. That's real annoying. Yeah. If you want to choke slam the other player. Yeah. Well, that's just one lie. more reason. That's just one more reason to make that a hard and fast rule. Don't step yeah. past until board bags are on the opposite board. It's it's easy. Mm. It's enforceable. Just just mm. that's where it should be. I mean, I was never a shit talker playing cornhole. I, <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> I'd never even I I didn't like to have conversations with my opponent, honestly. Yeah. I didn't want to lose my focus, but there's sometimes people would do that, and I'm like, Oh God! Oh, there were some people I couldn't stand playing because all they wanted to do was talk. Oh, say, say now I was I well I wouldn't say I was the opposite, but that part of the game didn't phase me in any way. I didn't care if there was music playing, talking. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't care. So if so if I was playing against somebody that did put earbuds in, I would actually keep a count in my head of how many times I could make them take the earbuds out. <laughs> And that's me. why that's it's all why part you, of the plan. That's why you always beat me, man. That's why you <laughs> always beat me. <laughs> Look, I, I don't think that's why I was always like that mid card card guy, you know, like in wrestling, let's use some more wrestling metaphors. So I was <laughs> always like that guy that won the intercontinental belt. 
you know. I never made it to the heavyweight belt, uh, but I was like intercontinental. Maybe not even that. The U.S. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> I was like the Dean Malenko. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if you know who he is. He yeah. Was, yeah, he was one of them wrestlers that button. never obtained it. But, yeah, I think that was my problem, the focus. I just couldn't get there with the focus. You were yeah. you were intercontinental. Yeah, That's I'll the level that. you were on. Here's another thing I wanted to talk to you about. I saw a post from a cornhole player here in North Carolina about um, trading cards. So, Tops, oh. Tops is partnered with the ACL, and I guess that their pro players are getting their own – uh trading cards but can't <laughs> anyone get a trading card from tops i they do have a custom program on the website um okay yeah i've, I've never done it it would be fun to do that <laughs> i would i'm thinking about, about an outsider's card <laughs> for the podcast yeah <laughs> well toby oh man here check this out so make sure you tune in in a couple of weeks i've got the pocky chip challenge coming to hammered oh. I've got oh, no. three of these bad boys right here ready to go. The studio is going to be on fire. I've got – I actually got one more chip coming uh, for another Brave Soul. So, we're going to see. This studio is going to melt down. These oh, things my. are expensive, man. You know, so. for one chip, depending on where you go, the cheapest I found was eBay. I had to win the auction to get them, and it was uh, $20 a piece. But for I've seen – For one chip, I've seen them as much as 30 to $50 for a chip wow crazy wow. man but somebody's asshole is gonna be on fire i can guarantee it wow yeah, yeah. <laughs> that makes me sweat just looking at the box <laughs> oh man that box looks like death but oh. anyway that's gonna be in a couple of weeks folks but yeah. hey man i just want to uh, toby thanks for joining me tonight it's good talking to you again good seeing you it's been a while so and you too uh, man thank you I, I appreciate it this has been a lot of fun hey and like i said man if you want to make that comeback the outsiders, we can do it. You know, <laughs> we'll get our own if, jerseys. Oh man, if I uh, if I tried to do it now, I would truly be an outsider. I wouldn't be able to hit the board or anything else. <laughs> oh shit, man! Cornhole, man. Once you reach a certain level and all the muscle memory, you never lose it. It comes back <laughs> after the first couple of beers and first twenty throws. <laughs> <laughs> but all right, Toby, you be good out there in Florida, brother. And hey, once again, it's been cool. Thanks again for being on Hammered.